Well, good morning, Village Church. Would you please stand up with us as we worship? If you're in your home and you're sitting on the couch, stand up and worship with us. If you're at one of our outdoor services, stand up and let's praise our God. Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places, even as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us for adoption to himself as sons through Jesus Christ according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, 
with which he has blessed us in the beloved.
still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Still be my vision, O oh, ruler of all. Well, Lord Jesus, we just ask that you will still be our vision, God our ruler. God, in this time where we are so separated, you are there for us. Remind us of the relationship with you and the people that surround us today. God, you are good. You are great. You are the one who gives vision. You are the one we can trust in, the one that we can go to in times of trouble. We pray all of this in Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, Village Church East. It is great to see you again. We are online again. My name is Craig Jarvis. I'm the lead pastor of Village Church East, and we were supposed to meet together today. I was so excited about that possibility, but we ran into some challenges as far as uh, personnel to help us run the live stream. And I have a deep desire for us to do church together always. And so in our effort to do a morning service in person, we need to get that live stream up and running. So we are looking for volunteers. We need about three to four volunteers to help us out on Sunday morning. Even if you're not tech savvy, uh, there's, there's not a whole lot involved with most of the responsibilities to get us up on live stream. Uh, and we have lots of people that can train other people. So we're looking for a couple extra volunteers. Our desire is to get back to Fountain View get back to meeting in person. And so we're only lacking three to four volunteers. So if that's you, uh, this is your pastor's plea to you to maybe text me and let me know that you'd be interested, even if you're not tech savvy, uh, maybe you'd be interested in just uh, sitting in the back and helping us with the live stream. That way we can meet in person and we can stay online. And that's really the goal. So I'm glad that you're here this morning. I'm glad that we're able to do church again uh, this morning. And I am anxious because we get into a brand new study today. Our study this morning and for the next few weeks is going to be on the fruit of the Spirit. Have you ever met somebody that you thought looked holy or somebody that you thought was holy? Maybe they had a holy look to them. Uh, maybe they acted different. Maybe it's something that they wore that made indicated to you that this person was really kind of a holy individual. Lots of folks have a lot of different ideas about what it takes to make them look holy. And we kind of have an idea in our minds that in order to be holy, we got to be we got to be trying a little hard, doing something a little different. When I started out in ministry, I had one charismatic friend that sat down with me and he said, listen, Craig, you're starting out in ministry. And I got to tell you, if you haven't spoken in tongues, you are not holy. Well, I still haven't spoken in tongues. And I uh, guess that makes me not holy holy. So I just want to let the cat out of the bag, right? Right from the get-go, all right? What makes somebody holy? The only answer to that is Jesus Christ. There's nothing you do, there's nothing you wear, there's nothing you say that makes you holy. When Jesus Christ takes over your life, when you decide to follow him, you are declared holy. We talked a little bit about this last week, about what it means to be holy, set apart, kadosh, in the Old Testament. It's the idea of, of, of being different, set apart. And when God, when God lives in us through the power of the Holy Spirit, we are set apart. In Israel's case, they were called a holy nation. And in the case of the church, Peter says that we too are a chosen race, a holy people. There's a verse I want to share with you in Hebrews 2.11. It says, For he who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one source, that's Jesus Christ. He's the one who sanctifies and he's the one who does the sanctifying. That is why he's not ashamed to call them brothers. He makes us holy and we are made, those who are made holy all have one source. Jesus is the source of our holy lives. In 1 Corinthians 6, 11, it says this, but you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit and by the spirit, of our God. Now my life, now filled with the Holy Spirit, now rescued by Jesus Christ, 
My life is an attempt to let Christ live through me. And to this end, my goal is to walk according to the Spirit, which brings us to our study in the fruit of the Spirit. One reason I'm glad we're getting into this uh, topic, especially in our culture today, is many of us share blind spots, me included. We have blind spots in our lives that we're not aware of that just need tweaking, might need a little bit of work, might do be due to our upbringing, might be habits that we've gotten into, and we are not really even aware, maybe, of how those things don't keep in step with the Spirit. And so the Spirit of God is constantly working on us, working on our hearts and working on our minds to conform us to the image of Christ. As that happens, we live out a sanctified life. It is impossible to live this kind of life without the Holy Spirit at work within us. Sometimes we may not even recognize some of the things we're doing are in the sin category. Now, this is important because this is kind of where we're going to land today. The grace of God covers our sins and covers our blind spots. It gives us a deeper appreciation for God's grace when we may not even recognize our blind spots, but the Holy Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Our helper is given to us Jesus Christ himself said it's important that he, after his death and resurrection, it's important that he goes back to heaven so that he can send us this helper, this Holy Spirit. When he was talking to the disciples, he said this in John 16, 7, Nevertheless, I tell you the truth, it is to your what, church? It is to your advantage that I go away. Get that? It's to our advantage that Jesus leaves. Now, I don't know about you, but I have a hard time believing that because I'd really love for Jesus to be here. The problem is, if Jesus was here in this room, he wouldn't be in your room. And if he's in your room, he wouldn't be in somebody else's room. And if he's in another church, he wouldn't be in our church. It is to our advantage that he goes away. Why? For if I do not go away, the helper will not come to you. But if I go, I will send him to you. Do you get that? Jesus says, it's important that I go back to heaven because if that happens, when that happens, I will send the Holy Spirit and he will dwell in each of you. I will be present in you through him. So Jesus is in your living room and Jesus is in our living room. Jesus is present through the power of the Holy Spirit at work within his people. The Holy Spirit gives us this ability to have Christ with us at all times. We're standing on this brand new series, the study of the fruit of the Spirit of God. And the, the, the crux of all of this is when we decide to follow Jesus, the Holy Spirit takes dwelling in us, declares us holy, and helps us to live in a way that pleases Jesus Christ. Helps Jesus come out of us more. Helps us recognize our blind spots more. Believers are not set apart by what they do or don't do. I know, I, I know. Uh, it's, it's hard to hear that because we live in a world that says, ah, no, you got to be good. You got to be good to impress God. It doesn't work that way. Believers are set apart. They're holy, not because of what they do or don't do, but because of who lives in them. It's not because of their actions. It's because of the one who lives in us. He declares that we are holy. Remember, anything that God touches is made holy. A holy sepulcher, a holy temple, holy ground. You remember, take off the shoes you're standing because the place you're standing is holy. Anything God touches is holy. And when God touches our lives and fills us with his Holy Spirit, we are holy ground. That blows me away. Because anywhere I go, I take Christ with me through the power of the Holy Spirit. And as I live for Jesus, the fruit of the one who lives in me begins to define me. This is what we mean when we say, by their fruits, we will know them. Because as we, as the Holy Spirit takes his dwelling up in our lives, he begins to crush sin and he begins to help us live as Christ would live. This series will help us define who the Spirit is and how he can help us live more like Jesus Christ. So let's dive in Galatians chapter five. This is where we find the fruit of the spirit. 
I want to start at verse 16, even though we're going to back up a little bit, but verse 16 is so crucial for us to understand. But I say, walk by the Spirit. Church, would you say that with me, please? Ready? Even no matter where you are in your homes, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Walk by the Spirit means keep in step with the Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but uh, sometimes I'll go to church picnics, and one of the one of the most popular games at church picnics is the three-legged race. And whenever I do three-legged races with somebody, I I always practice. I, we we tie our legs together, and we and, and we do a lot of practice because I'm in it to win it. I don't know about you, but that's what I play for. I play to win. So when we do three-legged race, I'm not just walking; I'm running. And so we practice. We tie our legs together, and we practice, and we practice. And if you don't stay in step with one another and you're cruising down to the end, uh, to, the, to the ribbon at the end, you are going to fall and you are going to tumble and you're going to fall out of step. The spirit in the believer's life is there to help us keep in step. Keep in step with Christ. Surrender to keep in step with God's spirit is our key to living like Jesus. This is all over Galatians chapter 5. It's all over the New Testament, but especially here. Verse 16, it says, live by the Spirit. Verse 17, the Spirit teaches us to live what is contrary to the sinful nature. Verse 18, we are led by the Spirit. Verse 22, we are to exhibit the fruit of the Spirit. Verse 25, we live by the Spirit. Verse 25, again, keep in step with the Spirit. Matthew Henry says it this way, the best antidote against the poison of sin is to walk in the spirit. I want to talk to you this morning about how that happens in our lives. It is not a matter of trying harder. It's a matter of surrendering so that we keep in step with the spirit of God. All we can do is demonstrate over and over in our lives that we can't do this on our own. We can't be holy. No matter how many times we go to church, no matter how many penance activities we do, no matter how many good actions we do, all we demonstrate time and time again is we have this inability to remain holy. So God gives us a solution. He gives us his spirit. His spirit makes us holy. Christ died for me to make me holy. Christ lives in me to make me free. When is the last time you heard somebody in church declare that Christ has died to set you free? Now think about that. Christ hasn't died to make us more holy or make us look more holy. Christ has died to set us free. Therefore, we are told not to go back to a yoke of slavery. The yoke of slavery is all the demands other people make on us to make us look like we are holy. I know this, this goes against most teachings in many different churches. Christ came to set us free. Christ did not come to put a yoke of slavery on us. Paul says, don't submit to that kind of silliness. The silliness of coming to Christ, being set free, and then receiving a huge book of rules to follow made up by somebody else. If you belong to God, Paul says, you are already set apart. You are already holy. Jesus didn't rescue you or anyone else to put you back into chains of religious demands. We're, we were shackled to our sins. It controlled us. It lied to us. It, it stole years from our lives. It required a penalty that we could not pay. But Jesus disguised himself and came behind enemy lines. He came behind enemy lines because he came to set us free. He walked straight into our prison cell. He unlatched the door, he opened it, and he said, you are free. He didn't come to put us back into a prison. He came to set us free. That is why Paul says in verse 13, you were called, for, it, for you were called to freedom, brothers. Slavery is my inability to stop sinning. Freedom is my ability to start glorifying God. When I was a slave, I did not have any opportunity to glorify God. I was shackled to my sin. When I am freed by Jesus Christ, I have this great opportunity now to please God, to glorify God with my life. 
Jesus chases me down to snatch me out of slavery and give me freedom. Talking about freedom sometimes makes folks nervous. They might say, you mean, Craig, I'm free to do whatever I want? For some, that's an overwhelming thought. My, the tendency is to go one of two ways on this, isn't it? The tendency is to go legalistic or the tendency is to go license. Legalism means you got to follow a list of do's and don'ts. That's what we are, our, that's our knee-jerk reaction. That's the, that's the part of religion that kills. License is the freedom to do anything we want with no accountability. That too will kill. You see, if the pendulum goes too far on the license part, you're going to destroy yourself. If the, if the pendulum goes too far, uh, far on the legalism part, you're going to destroy yourself and you're going to destroy others. Now, Paul expects us to be mature about some things. Later on in the, in the passage in verse 19, he says, listen, we already know the works of the flesh are obvious. It's like, do I really need to write these down for you? But he does. He says the works of the flesh are evident. We're not free to do these things. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of rage, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, a bad list, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. He's saying, let's be mature about this. You're not freed in order to go back to this prison of debauchery. You've been rescued from these things. You, you, you didn't have a choice before you had to sin. Now you've been freed to have the ability to glorify God in the way we live our lives. To have the ability to have the hands of Christ, the heart of Christ, the eyes of Christ to all those around us. But what about the gray areas? And this is really a part of life for Christians that we struggle with because all of us have gray areas. Well, should I do this or shouldn't I do this? It's not really spoken about in the Bible. This is where Paul is landing in Galatians 5. He says, walk in step with the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. You will sit down and think to yourself, mm, is this okay for me to do? And if it's okay for me to do, why would I want to do it? What is my motivation in doing this? And we begin to analyze all the things that life throws at us through the eyes of a mature believer, somebody that's keeping in step like a three-legged race with the Spirit of God. Now, this might shock you, so I'm glad you're sitting down. Cancel culture, the culture in which we live, says you should be free, but steals your freedom. Cancel culture is about taking away your opinion and your freedom. Christ culture is about giving you freedom and letting you have your own opinion. <laughs> Christ has come to set us free. Now the world will tell you, well, religion won't set you free. We will set you free. But we're finding out now that their freedom is based on popular vote, loudest voices, whatever hill they want you to die on. And if you don't agree with them, they'll beat you down. You see, cancel culture is about taking away your opinion and taking away your freedom while telling you, you are free. Christ is about setting you free indeed. Culture demands conformity. Christ releases us to freedom. Freedom is not only the ability not to sin, but the ability to glorify God at any moment with whatever I've invited into my life. That's a good statement. Now the warning. Paul goes on to say, only don't use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. Say that with me one more time. I love it. Through love serve one another. Those five words are powerful. We have been freed so that we can love enough to serve one another. For prisoners who are set free, the temptation is to use their freedom crazy, to, to, to go crazy when they come out of prison. But our freedom was purchased by Jesus' blood for a reason. And the reason is, now that I'm free, the reason is Jesus wants me to live like he lived. Jesus wants me to continue his mission. He tells us what his mission is 
through love, serve one another. In fact, it goes in verse 14. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. What is that, church? You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus set us free to continue his mission in the world. And what is his mission? Matthew 20, 28. Even as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to what, church? To serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. To serve to the point of death. Jesus set believers for, free for the same reasons, free to serve one another in love. In fact, in 1 Corinthians 13, it says, these three remain faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these is love. Love means letting go to let God work in you and in others in his own time. <laughs> love is the ability it means letting God do his work in you and others in his own time. Now, for those of you that know me, you may know that I love to fly fish. I, it's my Sabbath. It's, uh, it's something that I enjoy doing. It clears my mind. It gives me a lot of time to pray. And uh, sometimes I take some friends along with me, some family members. Uh, yeah, you see that, that cute little girl right there. That's Abigail with a fish. Uh, I love fly fishing. I love sharing that with others. I want to tell you something about fly fishing, though. When you're fly fishing in the river, free land is at the bottom of the river. Any round that is covered by water is free. No one owns that property. But the minute you touch land, somebody owns that. Now, it could be, it could be the government owns it. It could be private property. But somebody owns that land. Sometimes where there's no restrictions on the land, there is chaos. There's garbage everywhere. You'll see pop cans and unkept ground and rotting animals that have been eaten by other animals. And sometimes you'll come across ground that is just uncared for. And sometimes you'll come across other ground that has private property posted all around it. No one's allowed. The minute you get out of the water, you are breaking the law. They are strict about their private property, and there are signs on every tree. Don't get near those parts of dry ground. Now consider, if you would, if you were in a place fishing and each side of the water was different. Let's say the left side of the water was used by everyone. It had cans and garbage and fly line laying all over the place. And if you stood on that shoreline, you would, have, you would have a tendency to kind of join in the chaos. You'd think to yourself, nobody's keeping this up anyway. I'll throw my water bottle down here. I'll throw my fly line down here. Nobody really takes care of it. I'll just join in the chaos. Discard your fishing line. Nobody will ever notice. While on the other side of the river, on the private property sign, where the fines will hit you if you cross over, if you wander too close to that shoreline, you think to yourself, well, seeing the other part of the river, this sounds reasonable. It should be private property. They should charge a uh, fine for people to go on this. I wouldn't want these disgusting fly fishermen on my property either. Look how beautiful and ornate this part of the river is on this side. But you could also, if you own the property, say, yeah, I'm not like those vagabonds on the other side of the river. That's chaos on that side of the river. My side of the river is pristine. Nobody on that side of the river should ever come on this side of the river. And the tendency is to condemn the people on the other side for their lack of rules, while the tendency of people on the other side is to condemn you for being too strict. While the waterway is free, on one side is legalism, and on the other side is license. Walking with the Holy Spirit means giving grace to let others walk with the Spirit of God at their own pace. And the minute you start judging those on the shoreline is the minute you begin to resent them. You look at people on the shoreline of the chaotic side and you resent them for their craziness. And you look at people on the other side and you resent them for their private property signs. And the danger is you begin to resent each other when you get too close to either shore. Verse 15 says, this is when we begin to bite and devour each other. 
If you bite and devour each other, watch out that you're not consumed by one another. You see, we have a very judgmental attitude when we go on the side of legalism. And we have a very judgmental attitude when we go on the side of license. Walking in the freedom of the river and letting others walk in the freedom of the river and wander around closer to one side or the other is what it means for Christ to set us free. The last thing Jesus would ever want us to do is to bite and devour people on one side or the other of this river, the ones who are closer to either shoreline. And we should be careful because when we judge the other person, we have a tendency to hit the log in our own eye. The key is to walk in the river and let others walk at their own pace. Some are going to be closer to the shore of legalism. Some are going to be closer to the shore of license. But listen, church, it is the Spirit's responsibility to keep them in check. Now, you might be saying, well, Craig, can't we warn them? I mean, wouldn't you warn your children if they were wandering too close to one shore, they're being too legalistic, or they're being too much with license, and, and their lives are looking a little chaotic? Absolutely. We are called to accountability. We are to warn one another, but always we are to warn one another in love. We let the Spirit teach them where to walk in the river. Second Thessalonians 3.14 says this, If anyone does not obey what we say in this letter, take note of that person, have nothing to do with them, that they may be ashamed. But verse 15 says, Don't regard them as a what, church? Don't regard them as an enemy, but warn them as a brother. You see, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. It's our job to warn, but always to love and let the Holy Spirit do his job. Now, keep in mind, the person in 1 Thessalonians is not obeying the word of God. They're ignoring the word of God, but he is still not our enemy. He is our brother or our sister, and we are to warn him in love. It is our responsibility to help each other grow. That's why we're a family. When Cain murdered Abel, God came to Cain and said, where's your brother Abel? And Cain said, am I my brother's keeper? And the answer to that church is, yes, we are. We need this lesson today because we live in a canceled culture that has begun to permeate the church. I have seen believers on Facebook, Christians, who say that if you don't agree with them on some issue, they are going to defriend you. They'll call you a racist. They'll call you all kinds of names. And they will literally say, we are no longer friends. <laughs> there is no love in that language. This is straight up abuse. This has no place in a believer's life. You see, it's the Holy Spirit's job to convict. Now you may say, Craig, this is a really important issue. Yeah, I know. I know there's a lot of important issues that people don't agree with that I hold too. But my goal is not to make people look more like Craig. My goal is to help people look more like Christ. And that should be our job together as a church. Let the Holy Spirit work. And we can warn them as brothers. The abuse of those living under license is they don't demand any boundaries of the, uh, 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 at all. The abuse of those living under legalism is they demand conformity to what they believe. Now, if you have challenges in these areas, you may realize that you might be standing on one of these shorelines. And the shores, those who stand on the shore of license, yell at those on the shoreline of legalism. And those on the shore of legalism, yell at those on the shoreline of license. But those who are in the river, walking in the freedom of Jesus Christ, letting the Spirit of God walk them through life. They don't yell. They spend far more time praying for one another, reaching out to one another, warning if that needs to happen, but always in love. How do you know you're on one shore and not the other? Simply this, church, we bite and devour each other. Listen, Jesus died to set us free. Church, say it with me. Jesus died to set us free. Live out your freedom. Live in the river. Live on the, uh, in the waters of the freedom that God provides. And let others live out their freedom. Allowing freedom 
is the way that we live out Jesus Christ. This is a true act of love. People in the river hold each other accountable out of love. Love might say, you need to get back in the river. You're in a dangerous place. But love never condemns. See, judging is God's arena. Loving is ours. Verse 16, I finish with this. But I say, walk by the Spirit and you'll not gratify the desires of the flesh. Consider this life series that we're about to, to enter into might be a life-changing series for you. The first time my dad uh, read and, and started studying about grace, which is really what we're diving into here today. Now, God gives us grace and we are to give each other grace to grow. The first time my dad was learning about this for the first time when he was about, actually about my age in his life, he he, he got angry about it. He didn't like what he was learning because he had, he, he had always thought our, our responsibility is to hold each other accountable. And it is. But our job is not to change people. That's God's job. Our job is to walk with the Spirit. God gives us all kinds of ways so that we can see these blind spots in our lives. We have our conscience, but our conscience is only as good as our upbringing. We have the Word of God, but that's only as good as you know it and you've hidden it in your heart. We have the community of faith, that's the church, but that's only as good as the health of the church that we're attending, the health that we've agreed to hold each other accountable to. Romans, uh, Revelation 2 and 3 have seven different churches, most of which had gone astray, and we're not holding each other accountable to love like they should love. And we have the Spirit of God. Now, the Spirit of God is remarkably consistent, church. Every believer, the same Spirit fills them. Every family, the same Spirit guides them. Every unbeliever, the same Spirit convicts them. Every church, the same Spirit unites them. But the Spirit of God is only as good as our willingness to surrender to Him. And this is where freedom comes into play. We have been freed to walk with the Spirit of God. Church, we have been freed to walk with the Spirit of God. Let's grow and let others grow according to God's grace. For all who are led by the Spirit of God are sons of God. Romans 8, verse 14. So what? Well, we started out by telling, by, by talking about how rules don't make us holy. What we wear doesn't make us holy. What we do does, doesn't make us holy. Christ makes us holy. Now it's a process of walking in step with the Spirit, doing a life three-legged race with the Spirit of God leading the way. My freedom has everything to do with how I treat others. We're all swimming in the same river. We're all walking the same river. Don't use your freedom to judge and condemn those around you. Use your freedom to serve one another in love. This is why we are called to be free. This is what we're called to be to, to free to do. There are four one another's used in these passages that we've already talked about. Serve one another, love one another, don't bite and devour one another, and don't consume one another. It's all about the fact that we're not in this to, we're not in this alone. We're in this together. You'll know you're on the shoreline living outside of your freedom in Christ if you spend more time judging than loving those around you. Let me say that one more time, because it's crucial. You'll know you've entered the shoreline of legalism or license when you spend more time judging rather than loving those around you. You'll also know you're there if you spend more time yelling at them than praying for them. So how do you use your freedom in Christ? How do you let others use their freedom in Christ? Number two, my freedom has everything to do with how I let God lead me. I have to be careful. The objective of free people is to keep in step with the Spirit, not to wander too close to the shore of legalism and not to wreck on the shore of license. Keep in step with the Spirit. Beware of the shoreline. Walk in the middle of the, of the river. And walking there can be exhausting. Believe it or not, it's easier to live on one side or the other. Did you know that? 
The water is much easier to walk in closer to the shore. It's much quieter. The current is much less demanding. The stress on our footing is much less emotionally exhausting. Do you know why people sometimes love being legalists? It's much easier to check a box and say, this makes you holy, this makes you holy, this makes you holy. It's easier to check a box than to live in the freedom and let others live in the freedom that Christ has called them to live in. Legalists crush love. They say, you must become who I want you to be or we can't have a relationship. Do you know why some people abuse license? They declare that they don't have to listen to anyone else. <laughs> God is leading them and they don't have to pay attention. There's no compelling reason for somebody who is on the shore of license to reconcile or to ask for forgiveness or to find personal submission to a brother or sister. They just cast off the other person because they don't believe like they do. They write them off because they don't appreciate the license that they have found in their own lives. You see, what license does is, license ignores love. Love seeks to reconcile. Love seeks to get along with other people and let them have their own opinion. Love seeks to let people grow in Christ as we are growing in Christ. License, license says that it's not worth all the work of reconciling with somebody so different from me. I'll just move on to another group of people. I'll abandon my responsibility to show love and grace to you, and I'll find somebody else that's more like me. Birds of a feather always flock together. Love for others only will go as far for somebody in license. When it impedes on my freedom, license means I don't have to try anymore. But there's a third one. Freedom promotes love. Freedom is found in the river church. The whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. Don't judge. Love. You do your job. Let's let the Holy Spirit do his. Pray with me. Father, I thank you for this passage in Galatians that is so, so chock full of meaning. And I pray, Father, that as we have spent some time now looking at what it means to live in the freedom for which you've called us to live in. Help us, Father, not to judge one another. May it not steal our joy by creating in us this, this, this unsatisfied need to be right and to make people look like us. Father, let us trust you with the growth of those around us. And may we just be an example of love by serving those around us, whether they're closer to the shore of legalism or closer to the shore of license. May you use our love to penetrate through. And may we all as your church realize the freedom for which you have set us free. Thank you for giving us this ability to love and serve one another, freed from our jail cell, free to be you, your hands, your feet, your eyes, your heart to those around us. May you use us to change this generation. Give us the patience to love those who are difficult to love and give us the tenacity to keep in step with you. I pray in Jesus' name, amen. Some tweet.
finish our service by doing communion together and the reason we do this is because it's a reminder to us that no matter where we are different homes different places joined online we worship the same God through the same Spirit of God the Spirit of God is a gift to us that makes us family he is what gives us this incredible ability to worship God it is his presence in our lives that makes us family. And in the verse that I read earlier, it is, it is because of this family that we have the ability to call Jesus our brother. I always get blown away by that verse. Like, he is pleased that we call him brother. I'm comfortable calling him Lord. I'm comfortable calling him Savior. But in scripture, we get to call him brother. Why? Because the Spirit of God joins us together as family, makes us one. We are adopted as sons and daughters into the family of God. And so when we come to communion, that is what we celebrate. We celebrate our ability to have communion with God through the power of the blood of Jesus Christ and the body that he gave us on the cross. And we have the ability to fellowship with one another as brothers and sisters, because that blood applied to our lives makes us family. And so I read for you 1 Corinthians Chapter 11, starting in verse 23, this is the passage that we read before we come to our communion time uh, together. And I read this for you once more again this morning. Oh, let me give you a minute. If you uh, don't have your communion items, run and get them real quick right now. Uh, we are using whatever is available in our homes. So if this is your first time joining us for communion, sometimes we use crackers or I think I got a cookie today. We use whatever we have in our homes. And uh, it's not the thing that makes us holy. It's not, we don't drink and that makes us holy. We are holy because Jesus has already made us holy. We take the bread and the cup as a reminder to us that Jesus' death on the cross, his death applied to our sins makes us holy. Jesus makes us holy, not the bread, not the juice. So with that understanding, let me read this to you. 1 Corinthians 11, verse 23. For I received from the Lord what also I delivered to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. 
In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. And so, church, I would like to, with you, eat and drink, and in doing so, proclaim the Lord's death, which makes us family until we see him again face to face. Would you eat and drink with me? It has been a great privilege to do worship with you again. A sermon out of the book of Galatians. I'm excited as we go through the fruit of the Spirit. I'm anticipating some major points of decisions that probably will go on in all of our lives as God removes the blind spots and reveals to us areas that we can grow as we learn to walk with the Spirit, surrendering to Him, living in the freedom of the stream, I'm anxious to see how He will grow us through a deeper knowledge of what it means to walk according to the Spirit. I want to pray with you, church, before I go. And uh, Lord willing, I will see you here again next week. Father, may you bless us. Take us from here with your blessing and cover us with your grace. Each person that's watching, may you provide them with an incredible amount of assurance that they are freed by you from sin, from the penalty of sin, and from all the demands of religiosity. Lord, may you help us to live as free people. Thank you for all that means for us, and thank you for loving us the way that you do. May you bless us now as we go, and may we be a blessing to others. May we serve one another in our freedom in love. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you, church. Have a great Lord's Day, and we will see you next Sunday.